My name is Isaac Hepworth. Uh, I'm a product manager at Google. Um, I work a lot on supply chain stuff. Um, I work on Google's own internal supply chain. Um, I do a lot of work in open source as well. Um, I chair the uh, Supply Chain Integrity Working Group in OpenSSF. I um, work closely with the, the Salsa team, Sigstore, and, and so on. Um, and I'm here with my colleague, Brandon, who will introduce himself to. Hi, I'm Brandon. Um, I'm a software engineer at Google. I, I work on software supply chain um, as well as open source security, um, both concentrating on metadata, what to do with it, a lot of S-bombs, as we're going to talk a lot about today, S-bomb, Vex, um, Salsa, and, and all that jazz. Um, also involved with the CNCF tech security as well. All right, great. Well, thanks for turning out to talk about S-bombs. Quick show of hands before we get started. Who's heard of S-bombs? Awesome. OK. Who has heard of the US executive order um, which specifies uh, an S-bomb requirement? OK, good showing. All right, this is good context. Let's begin. Um, so we've got three things to talk about today. We're going to talk generally about Google's journey um, through the S-bomb landscape over the last couple of years. Uh, you know driven primarily in response to the executive order in the United States. I'll talk a little bit about you know, how we iteratively understood the assignment. What are we supposed to be doing? What does the executive order even say? What does it mean? How should we approach it? Uh, Brandon is going to talk a little bit about you know, our journey into the technical parts of SBOM land, the tooling and infrastructure we built, you know, how that played out, the, the types of properties we were looking for in SBOMs, how we guaranteed quality and so on. Um, and then at the end, Brandon and I are both going to share, you know, just a few of our hot takes, uh, some kind of, you know, insights or surprising things that we've learned on the journey uh, and give you a sense of, you know, what's next. Uh, so let's get started, you know, understanding assignment. Um, I, I started, uh, you know, I joined Google a, a few years ago and, you know, within a week or two of me joining Google, um, I received this email um, and the subject line is, producing an S-bomb for various ecosystems to meet the executive order. Uh, and it had this ominous line at the bottom, you know, Isaac, do you have bandwidth to drive this? Um, and, you know, I was, I was a couple of weeks in to, to, to Google, and, you know, apart from, like, training and everything, turns out I did have bandwidth to drive it. Um, and so, you know, let's, let's dive in. And I kind of figured I should start by understanding what is the executive order. Um, Turns out there's an executive order that came out from the Biden administration in May 2021, Executive Order 14028 on improving the nation's cybersecurity. And it's a long document, and I've linked each, each slide which has a URL in the footnote also has a QR code which will take you to that URL if, if you want to look up the primary source here. But the executive order, amongst other things, has an implication for software companies that supply products to the US federal government. And the implication is that these software producers have to be ready to provide S-bombs for their products. And there's an obvious question there. Um, what is an S-bomb and, and you know, how should we understand that? Um, well, it turns out that you know, CISA, um, a part of the US government, has got your back here. And CISA.gov slash S-bomb has actually you know, got a great, of, great set of resources on understanding software bills of materials. Um, and it, I love this quote here. An S-bomb is a nested inventory. It's a list of ingredients. Um, and it turns out that looking at you know, software supply chain and looking at the supply chain for, say, you know, packaged foods, there's, there's a set of really rich parallels there. And how you think about you know, salsa could be the, the tamper-proof seals on your, your food, and, you know, uh, or it could be the, you know, the food handling processes you use in your food manufacturing. And amongst these rich parallels, I think that you know, thinking of an S-bomb as a list of ingredients for software um, is actually a really useful way to think about it. Um, and CISA will guide you and, and give you a list of what are they useful for. And again, you know, like foods. Um, you know, if I'm a producer of food, I, I should be keeping track of what's in it. So that's kind of my basic responsibility. Um, if I'm in the grocery store and I'm picking things off the shelves and I'm looking at ingredients labels, I can use the ingredients labels on foods to select foods which you know, I'm going to enjoy, which are going to be good for me. Um, and when I'm at home with those foods, as I'm consuming them, I can make sure, again, looking at the ingredients, that I'm not allergic to any ingredients. Um, you know, these ingredients don't have any known contaminants in them. Um, you can think of those as vulnerabilities, maybe. Um, but I can assess that ingredients list at the point of consumption and decide, do I want to consume this food? The same is true for software. Um, and so CISA lays out use cases for S-bombs in these, uh, sorry, NTIA lays, lays out use cases for S-bombs in these three categories here. Um, 
mentioning NTIA, I just confused Cicero and NTIA. Um, one of the, the aspects of my journey through this world was making a whole load of new friends with a bunch of government acronyms, um, many of which I, I didn't know existed when I, when I started off here. Um, some of which uh, I, I really not quite sure how they fit into the picture today, and I would really struggle to, to demonstrate or join up a diagram of how will these various pieces fit together, how they interact, which ones produce normative requirements, which ones not, which ones are guidelines, which ones are specifications, where's regulation come from, where's legislation come from. There's a whole story here which is probably an entire other talk. Um, but as a product person, you know, I, I started off thinking, Let's think about the requirements. OK, I got this email. We're going to do something with S-forms to the executive order. How should I think about what the actual requirements are here? And I started here, simple enough. For each Google product, we're going to produce an S-bomb, and we're going to identify the dependencies of that product. It's simple enough. Um, and then you look a little bit closer at this, and you, you kind of highlight, well, you know, an, an S-bomb. Um, Maybe some more specificity is needed there, exactly. You know, again, I'm writing requirements. I need to kind of give engineering teams at Google a sense of exactly what are they going to have to do. Um, so it turns out that NTIA, again, has your back. There's a document called the Minimum Elements for a Software Bill of Materials. This is a great document, super approachable, super short, very understandable. Um, and it lays out from the US government's perspective what makes for a kind of a baseline adequate SBOM. Um, and it talks about you know, the minimum set of data fields that an SBOM should, should include about each dependency. It has some mention of automation support, what serialization formats and interchange formats you should be thinking about. You know, I've highlighted SPDX here, and Brandon's going to talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then I really love this thing down the bottom right about the accommodation of mistakes. Um, you know, it was a welcome discovery to see the US government thinking this way, that you know, this idea that as S-bombs become operationalized at scale, um, there will be hiccups from time to time. Um, and S-bomb consumers should be fairly lenient with respect to genuine errors made in good faith. And I thought, again, that highly pragmatic, um, really approachable as a, you know, as a baseline specification document. Um, so I, I love this document. Definitely recommend you check it out if you haven't before. So we have some idea about what an SBOM is, and we can go back to our requirements and produce a second draft. So now, for each Google product, we're going to produce an SBOM in line with NTI's minimum requirements, identifying its dependencies. And you may think, OK, we're done, great. Um, but actually, you, you look a little bit closer in this, and you go, well, each Google product, that's a lot of Google products. Um, you, know, think, you know, Wing, Google Wing, uh, Wave, Waze, Waymo, Workspace, the Pixel Watch. These are just the ones starting with W. Um, and so there's a whole ton of Google products to think about. And you know, again, as a product person, again, as someone on a timeline, I'm thinking about you know, how can we scope this? How should we think about from the universe of Google products, where should we begin? Um, well, in this case, NIST shows up um, and has this, this document here, again, linked from the slide, um, and has actual guidance on what NIST defines as EO critical software and a list of characteristics which software has to be considered critical in the context of the EO. And that gave some great guidance as to where we should focus our efforts to begin with, um, which products we should prioritize, um, how we should phase our approach to building SBOMs across Google's product portfolio. So we'll go back and revisit our requirements again. And we'll now just make this slight tweak here for each Google product in scope. We're going to produce an SBOM, NTI's minimum requirements, identifying its dependencies. And again, you may think, well, we're done, right? Well, not quite, because there's, there's nuance lurking in this word dependencies here. Um, and SBOMs, you know, were originally conceived for a world of, of packaged software where, you know, you you get software on maybe a floppy disk, like that Chrome floppy disk that we saw with the, the SBOM illustration. And you know, in that sense, you look at what are the bits and bytes on that distribution? What are the bits and bytes you give to a customer? And you can kind of you know, imagine notionally starting at the middle of the floppy disk, working your way out to the edge. And when you got to the edge, you're done. You've inventoried the whole thing, and all the, everything you've captured is your dependency set. Um, well, you've talked there about, you know, perhaps you talked about the bundled runtime dependencies, but there are other dependency types too. Um, your software may have shared dependencies with, with other pieces of software on the same deployed platform. There may be build dependencies. What tools were used to build the software? What tools used to test it, to link it, to integrate it, to sign it, to package it? And this is important, again, from a think of it in the food analogy. Yes, I want to know the ingredients in my peanut butter. 
They may also want to know what machinery in the factory made that peanut butter. Was it leaking engine oil into the peanut butter while it did so? And so, you know, the, the build tools you use do have an implication about product quality. Um, service dependencies, again, the Chrome example. Sure, you may imagine Chrome on a floppy disk, but Chrome itself syncs to the cloud, syncs bookmarks, cookies, passwords. So, you know, there's a hidden server side of Chrome which you may not consider, but it's a dependency of the product. So service dependencies perhaps come into scope. There's platform dependencies too. What about the operating system? What about infrastructure or middleware this stuff runs on? Is that a dependency also? And then configuration as well. Configuration can change the behavior of software, can change what it's vulnerable, vulnerable to. And so there are implications there for how you think about dependencies. Again, as a pragmatic product person, I decided to scope in, let's try and focus on the most critical part of the SBOM, which we identified as the bundled runtime dependencies, including transitive ones. So we come back to this idea of we're shipping a piece of software, inventory all the bits and bytes of the software, and you're done. But we're not quite done, because this word identifying here, there's some nuance here as well. How should we actually have an SBOM which identifies the components? What identification scheme do we use for software components. Um, you know, a given piece of software, you know, Log4j in this case, um, may be referred to by a bunch of different names, different capitalizations, maybe including, uh, you know, version numbers. There's a combinatorial explosion of ways to even think about Log4j. And then when you try and boil that down to a, you know, an actual unambiguous externally referenceable identifier, um, there's more to it than meets the eye. Um, and I've linked from the bottom here, um, CISA actually put out a request for comments in October last year, asking the industry for you know, input as to how should this problem be approached. Um, for open source, it actually turns out that PURLs, P-U-R-L, um, is, a, is a great identification scheme. Um, for closed source components, it's a relatively unsolved problem. It's not solved terribly well right now, and there are active efforts to try and do better here. Uh, we ended up using pearls, um, and so you know we're going to say our requirements here now say not just identifying the components, but using unambiguous external identifiers. Um, and you know what? We're going to add one more thing as well, which is we're going to add why are we doing this? And the focus of this initial effort was to make vulnerability management easier for customers. Why is that important? Because it turns out that you know one of the primary things you need to think about when generating S bombs is how do I join up my S bomb data set? to a vulnerability data set. And if your vulnerabilities are indexed using one set of software IDs and your SBOMs are indexed using a different set of software IDs, you're going to have trouble. And so again, landing on pearls as a way to identify software allowed us to do that joining and allowed us to say, OK, now you know, consumers of this SBOM can join it to vulnerability databases um, and guide themselves down their vulnerability management journey. And at this point, you know, we kind of are done. And this, you know, a version of this, um, you know, actually a, a 12 or 13 page version of this statement here became the requirement stock for SBOMs at Google um, in service of the EO. Um, but even there, there are a few other considerations. I'm not going to go into great detail here. I'll talk a little about these, these myth mythical creatures, SAS bombs, later on in the talk. But you need to think about you know, a number of other factors here, non-functional requirements for how these S bombs are going to meet the world, how you're going to support them, and what they're going to look like when they're outside. But I'm going to hand over to Brandon now, talk more, a little more, more about the technical details of what went into our approach. Awesome. Thanks, Isaac. Cool. So let's get into how we actually did this. You know, what what services, what um, systems were involved. Uh, but before we go into the details of that, you know, we we kind of looked at the problem and wanted to figure out, you know, what are the big questions we want to ask that will eventually influence the designs that we're making. So the first thing we started off was like, what is like along Isaac's uh, kind of thinking, right? What is the S bomb? Like, what do we want of an S bomb from a you know technical generation perspective? And uh, the things we came up with was um, both for the EO, but also for vulnerability management, is accuracy and completeness. And this is around you know, does my S bomb contain the right dependency information so I can make vulnerability decisions? And the second one was something called trustworthiness. And this really boils down to the question, you know, can I, in good faith, use this S bomb for important decisions, or in this case, you know, give them to the government for compliance? 
And around these properties, we came up with a list of best practices and kind of trade-offs for all the things that we could do. And we will talk and highlight a few throughout this, this section. So the second broad question we were asking is, you know, along the lines of like, many people were asking when the EO came out, right, SPDX or Cyclone DX, like which standard should I use? Um, but this really led to a little bit of a broader question is, um, you know, how opinionated do we want to be? And in this case, given that the scope, as, as Isaac has pointed out, is huge, and you know, Google is huge, and has many products, um, you know, the any time we can, we can um, use less, that actually, so less is more in this case. So there are a lot of ecosystems, products, organization, tech techs. Whenever we say that there's only one common denominator, this means that we have better shared tooling and fewer integration points. So coming back to the question of SPDX or Cyclone DX, in this case, we said, you know what, based on the expertise we have and the familiarity and you know, analyzing the ecosystems for these two standards, um, SPDX is the standard uh, that we're gonna go with and no exceptions at all. So there are many other kind of such decisions that we have to make um, and we'll go through this again throughout the process. So technically, um, nuts and bolts, what's, what's included in fulfilling the EO from an engineering perspective is one, generation of S-bombs, um, two, storing the S-bombs, and then finally, you know, when, whenever uh, um, a request comes in from a compliance officer or a federal agency, we want to be able to retrieve the S-bombs that they want. So um, breaking this down into three, and let's start with generation. So in generation, I think we've seen a lot of different definitions of S-bombs. We have like source S-bomb, build S-bombs, analysis S-bombs, and like, you know, document was produced sometime last year talking about the different things and how they are all important. Um, but if we just scope this down to dependency information, we can kind of do a comparison across all these. And so we have source, build, and analysis S-bombs, which analysis S-bombs are really around artifact, um, uh, artif getting s bomb information from artifacts. And we took a look at this, and if we look at, you know, on the far left, um, if we start looking at source, right, if we take um, source and try and create an S-bomb from it, uh, what we found is we got a lot of dependencies. And like, a lot of dependencies is good, it means it's complete, but not necessarily accurate in the case of um, what we noticed was, you know, things from tests and plugins, and for example, Java built plugins, were all included in the S-bomb. So this doesn't necessarily reflect accurately um, the information in the artifact. And then again, if we go all the way to the other corner where we take analysis S-bombs, where we are scanning an artifact, um, you know, we find that the S-bomb is incomplete. And we showed this uh, two years ago, we had a talk in, uh, at KubeCon, uh, and we showed like if you had built a Rust binary and then you copied it into the container, you wouldn't see no dependency information of that Rust binary at all. And, and this, is, this is part of, part of the process. I think like builds are inherently lossy and therefore we, we run into the problem of incompleteness. So we are in a little bit of a Goldilocks situation here, right? On one hand, it's too inaccurate, on, and on the other hand, it's too incomplete, right? Um, and so the only place where we really know how the software or the sausage is truly made is you know, where the sausage is made, uh, in which is, in this case is the build process, and more specifically, uh, the build tool. So what we ended up with, and in the spirit of um, being as close to built, right? So we, this was our first mandate. We said all EOS bombs that are produced can only be produced by a builder, right? So saying that only build processes can produce S bomb and builders was the first step. Um, having S bomb generation be the default in these builders went a really long way in kind of getting that and. On the team of you know less is more, you know we had many many products, but we only had maybe a handful handful of builders, and therefore it made sense. 
Um, and number two is like, what did we end up with uh, generation tooling? And following the same philosophy, right? We wanna focus on build tools as much as possible. And so in certain cases, so for example, like Android, where we had very uh, specific constraints, uh, we were able to say, you know, Android has its own builder. It's written mostly uh, with the Gradle um, package manager. And so we, will be, we, we created the SPX Gradle plugin, which we then uh, donated to the community. Um, and this build tool generates very accurate and very complete SBOMs. Um, another case where this is possible, and I know um, most of you may have heard of the Google Tree Mono repo. That's where we keep uh, a lot of code. Um, and in this repo, there's something called Blaze, and which is similar to Bazel, the open source version, where you declare your dependencies, you declare annotations, you kind of have a lot of metadata about your software. And so from this, we were also able to just pass the metadata and generate accurate and complete SBOMs. But Google is still like many, many, you know, it's still a tech company, and there's always a long tail of software where we have different use cases, we have specific needs, and we end up with a long tail of the many different ecosystems that we may not fully understand or we may not have the correct tools to deal with. And for, for that long tail of software, we use generic composition tooling. Um, SIF is one of them. We also have an internal tool that, that does that as well. So with generation out of the way, next is storage. And storage is easy, right? The s form, just put them in the database. Um, yeah, blob store. Um, but unfortunately, this wouldn't be an interesting talk. So, um, so let's talk a little bit of, you know, if we had the s form database, uh, what would we want out of it? And the question we want to ask is, you know, how do we create an s form database that we trust? We will end up, and you know, federal agencies will end up being using these S-bombs to make security and remediation decisions. Um, how do I know that I can trust it? And the same way we decide what food we want to eat, we depend on the labels that are on them, right? And in this case, in this picture here, um, um, provided by Isaac, there was this, uh, apparently this Amazon uh, wrap, which um, God knows what's in it because it's, it's a default template. <laughs> So to achieve this, um, for storage, we have a project called um, SIDO, or Supply Chain Log, uh, Integrity Log. Um, and contrary to the name, it's a bit of irony, but the purpose of the project is to break down metadata silos. Um, and so this component is in charge of gathering all the software metadata together, and then um, from all these events that happen in Google Supply Chain, and then make the metadata usable. And for those that are familiar with the OpenSSF Quark project, uh, this project has some similarities um, and is also worked on by the same team. So let's take a little bit into SIDO. Um, and so pre-EO, what does SIDO do, right? So uh, traditionally, when builders build an artifact, uh, they generate something called Salsa provenance, uh, which is a now OpenSSF project. And um, the TLDR, if you're not familiar with Salsa, is um, basically this document. It says, hey, I'm a builder. I built this artifact securely. Here's some additional build information about the build. Uh, here you go, and sign, signed off by the builder. And so what happens here is then Sido then validates and says, OK, great. This artifact with hash ABCD is good. And it was built by a trusted builder that I you know, verified the signature on. So that was Silo's purpose, right, day to day. And so when it came to S-bombs, you're like, okay, let's try it out, right? So let's do the first iteration. Let's say, okay, build this, send the S-bomb to Silo. Um, and in this case, it doesn't actually work quite well for multiple reasons. And, um, but the biggest reason in this case, the first problem we ran into is that S-bombs are not naturally very good at self-describing. And so um, the s -bomb may not be able to accurately describe which package or which piece of software that it's generated for. Um, and you know, this is especially so if you're using analysis s -bomb tooling, because they are always based on file system. 
So they don't have the logical view of what the software they're actually scanning is. They say, here are a bunch of files. I'm here uh, what's in these files. Here are all the dependencies. But I don't actually know what these files are for. And most of the time, the, um, the artifact analysis engine does not have the context to be able to put that in the S form. So what we ended up with is an in total attestation. We create a, a custom predicate called reference, uh, reference attestation. Um, and this reference attestation allows us to say, here's the S bomb, here's where it's located, here's the hash, and this is for software a, B, uh, with hash A, B, C, D. Right. So this is great because now we can say, if I have an artifact, here's the S bomb for it. Um, but we're still missing something. It's like, how do I know whether this S bomb was generated by the builder, or you know, I down I, I downloaded a bunch of files, I ran sift, and then I uploaded it to Silo. Um, and this is where you know we do the, the same as in Salsa, where we, we sign uh, the attestation, uh, and then the signature is validated by Silo. And this gives us two properties. One is that uh, the S bombs hold their integrity. Uh, we know they, ha they haven't been tampered with since they left the builder. And the second is we know that all the S-bombs come from a proof builder because they were signed by a builder key. And we know that for all these builders that we've actually have in our allow list, um, that we've vetted the s one generation process. And this is more like an engineering exercise where we talk to the different builders and like, ensure that you know, what their tooling strategy was okay, uh, they're doing the right things. Awesome. So with all the builders now sending their S bombs and attestations, you know, we get this really nice mapping of like, here's the URI of the artifact, here's the URI of the software, uh, here's the hash, and here's the path to the S bomb. Now, with this, retrieval should be simple as well, right? And as usual, famous last words. We also thought so. Um, we thought it would be straightforward. Um, so let's talk about it. So we want to be able to say here that I have a path to a container or hash. In this case, we say like some GKE container image, ABCD. Um, in this case, we want to say, okay, look up this container ID, give me back an SPDX document. Um, we ran this, and then we got nothing. So, right, where's the S forms? Yeah, like it's sneaking out somewhere. Um, so, why is this the case? And kind of it boils down to, um, you know, there are many cases we, we, we'll talk about a little bit more, um, but they all stem from this idea of like, it is a supply chain, and what we're doing is you're just looking at one part of the graph. And so, we need to look at it in terms of a graph. And in this case, uh, we look at the end of that supply, this supply chain, and we notice that, oh, look, the last step of it was actually uh, uh, image promotion, right? It was like, I took a staging uh, image, and then I copied it to production. It wasn't a build. Well, depends how you define build, but it wasn't like building a piece of software um, in, in terms of compilation, and so it didn't have an S-bomb. Um, so we didn't have an S-bomb for it. So let's kind of follow the graph back, right? So we go back, next step, look for S-bomb, still no S-bomb. So what's happening here? So let's go back further. And in this case, in fact, we find two S-bombs, right? Over here, we see you know, staging. We have two staging S-bombs being built, one, uh, each of them for different architectures. And then there's an assemble step where they become a multi-architecture image. And then the multi-architecture image just get, then gets promoted. Right? So this is what happens. And, and if we, we can just keep on doing this, going back and back. Um, and you know, we may find out, oh, there's a Rust binary or some other binary that's opaque that's built uh, early in the chain. And we, retu we return all the S-bombs that we find. Right? And this is exactly what we did. We implemented this. We said, um, and Thankfully, the S forms appeared. Um, so all was well. We didn't do all that for nothing. Um, and this is what we're using today. Um, so this is how we're returning S forms. We we don't do anything fancy with composing them. We just like kind of zip them up and say like here's all the S forms that you need. Um, 
but but yeah, like what what were some of these things, right? And um, here are some of the issues, type of issues that we ran into. Um, and you know, we found that a lot of this was including like repackaging, retagging, signing. Um, but our best practice here, takeaway is like you know, compose S bombs, obtain more complete S bombs. Um, and we find that each ecosystem generally knows what it's doing, right? Python knows what it's doing. Uh, NPM when it's building something knows what it's doing. Um, but where a lot of the incompleteness comes out is from packaging, where you're you're going cross ecosystem. And the same way we don't expect like the mailman to know what's in our Amazon package, um, we can't expect like a pack um, like a Docker build to know what's in the Rust binary. Awesome. So all this work, it was great, but I skimmed uh, a pretty big detail here, which is like, what's this graph that we're traversing? How did we get it? Where's this magic coming from? Um, like, how do I how do I get one of these? And um, for that, we can go back to the build. So as a quick recap, we saw this slide earlier, which is what Silo was doing pre EO. Um, basically, it's generating salsa provenance, and part of the attestations that are built with salsa um, in the salsa provenance is including what was also used to build the artifact, so the materials that went into the artifact. So, in this case, we have both the inputs and outputs of the build, and what we can do is we can take the salsa provenances and kind of just like chain them up, you know, one the output being the input of the next one and we can construct the graph of the supply chain. And we all do this by hashes, by source repositories, and so on. Um, so this is how we're doing the, the graph composition analysis. And you know, if you want to read more in detail, um, there's also a blog post that Isaac and I wrote about uh, a couple years back um, about how to do this and kind of like just the high level concepts of it. Great, and, and last but not least, um, just to, to wrap up this retrieval section, uh, one of the things that I talked about so far is like you have a URI, you have a hash, like what do I do with it? But I think the question that um, as we're doing run-throughs of the, the EO to try to run this um, with compliance, we notice that the request may look, you know, may be a little bit different, right? So in this case, you know, they may be asking something more like, Give me the S bonds for Pixel OS. They're not going to say, give me S the S bonds for SHA 256 uh, DEF, because you know that's what they're understanding from um, from their use of the software. Um, and what we found about this is, you know, this is really hard, and this really this is where we lean a lot on the product owners themselves to kind of have a sense of like how do I translate these requirements. Um, but one thing we found that is very effective, uh, and we found like successful teams do, is if they kept an inventory of the products they had and the product mapping. Um, so to sum up, you know, in generating S bombs, always use builders and build tools when possible. Uh, you can do the composition analysis otherwise and generate S bombs at all steps. Um, in storage, ensure S bombs are tested and signed. Um, salsa is a good thing to have to store them. Uh, use good software identifiers like URIs and artifact hashes. Um, and lastly, in retrieval, you know, compose S bombs whenever you can, recursively using Salsa, uh, and have product teams maintain some type of inventory mapping for their products. Awesome, and the fun section. All right, thanks, Brendan. Um, I think Brendan and I, having spent a few years looking at this and working together on this, we, we could talk pretty much forever about S-bombs. And definitely, if you are looking for more, come and find us afterwards. I'm happy to take more questions and follow up. Um, we've got a few things that we wanted to just highlight, some things that stood out to me. I'm going to start with a, a couple of things. And uh, Brendan has a couple of observations, and we'll close. Um, the first one um, that, I, you know, that I, I thought hard about, and I, I you know, I've come to some, some realization about is that I don't think that S-bombs are the goal of the executive order S-bomb requirement. Uh, people ask, you know, hey, you know, one, one day when the executive order deadline kicks in and all, everyone's producing S-bombs and giving them to the federal government, the federal government is going to wake up to 
you know, three quarters of a million S bombs in their inbox and wonder what to do. Um, and probably they're just going to take them and put them in a filing cabinet somewhere, at which point you may ask, well, what good was the executive order S bomb requirement? Um, and I think there, there are a couple of things that stand out to me. Uh, number one is, you're getting something like S-bombs off the ground um, in an industry. It's a really difficult chicken and egg problem. There's a cold start problem here that no one wants to produce S-bombs if no one's going to bother consuming them. And no one is, is build, going to build consumption tools or great tools to consume them if no one's producing them. Um, the great way or a great way to solve problems like this is with regulation, um, where the government will come in and say, OK, we're going to decide that you know, we're going to use the purchasing power of the federal government. And those words are used literally verbatim in the executive order, the purchasing power of the federal government um, to catalyze the industry to start producing S-bombs, to break this deadlock. The government is going to say, well, we now require S-bombs. And that means suppliers to the government are going to need to build them. And that means suppliers to those suppliers are going to need to build them. And so on, transitively up the chain. And so it's a, it's a catalysis motion to get S-bombs to begin to be operationalized in the industry, whether or not, and that's independent from whether or not the federal government actually gets individual utility from S-bombs. So that's number one on this point. Number two on this point is I think that Generally, you know, discovery that we've made along the way is that it is rather difficult to produce an S-bomb unless you have a, a certain amount of just basic baseline operational hygiene and operational discipline in your software supply chain. And so again, this is a way of you know, forcing that into the industry, starting to say, you know, this is now the new acceptable baseline. You need to at least know what the ingredients are in this software. That's a place to start. I really see it like this is a starting point for you know, an entire you know, decade-long journey. If I think back to the, the US food supply chain, the equivalent to, to the, this regulation came in in 1939 in the United States. And that was the, right, the legislation that brought in the mandate for ingredients labels on packaged foods. And it took about 20 years following that regulation to get to 50% of the US food supply chain are in compliance with that legislation. This is a long process. And so I think you know, the executive order S-bomb requirement is a catalysis motion, um, and it's a, it's a requirement that people just start to pay attention to this domain. Um, the other observation I'd share, and this is a little bit spicy, um, is that I, th I think that S-bombs are a poor fit for SaaS products. And, and why do I think that? Well, I think that you know, if you're in the world of packaged software, you've got that floppy disk, you look at the bits and bytes, you inventory them, you say, here's the ingredients of this thing I just gave you. And when you run that software and you, when you operate it, you know that you know, the totality of the components you're exposed to. How do you solve that problem for SaaS? Like, let's imagine that I go to docs.google.com, Google Docs on the web. What is the totality of computing infrastructure I'm now exposed to in using that software? Well, gosh, obviously, there's the, you know, the Google front end, which serves the web. There's all the JavaScript. There's the Google identity system, which has seamlessly logged me in. There's Google Drive, which is used for storage below Google Docs. Uh, there's a Google infrastructure like Spanner, which is used for storing the data behind this thing. There's probably all of Borg, of Google's compute fabric. And you pull on this thread because you're interested in transitive dependencies and what's your total dependency footprint. And you pull on this thread and pull on this thread. And before long, you've got the entire internet in your lap and you're really stuck. And so I think you know, that there's a consideration that you know, S-bombs are a good fit for SaaS. I don't think they're there yet. I think we need more specificity about how do we reason about this transitive dependency footprint in a, in a, you know, a risk-centric way. How do we think about the risks involved? And you know, there's a question about agency, who's operating the software, who's responsible for vulnerability management, and so on. So anyway, spicy take. There's more work to come. CISA itself um, is going to be putting out a white paper on this topic in, in the coming weeks and months. Um, and I think there's much more work to do here. Yeah, just like the last quick one, you know, like, like Isaac said, you know, that as bombs is only the beginning, we found a lot of these use cases internally that um, have been kind of what people are interested with as bombs and it provides a unique opportunity because we've gathered all the all this information of different products all in one place. And an example of that is, you know, we use um, um, Guac to kind of do some analysis and we took all the container as bombs that we had and we said, okay, Give me this open SSF scorecard of all the third party upstream dependencies. And now we have this mapping of like which are the most frequently used um, third party packages 
which on this top left hand quadrant also have a really really bad like open SSF scorecard score and you know then we can make this action to say okay let's create uh, let's have more efficient security investment to fix things which are used more widely. Awesome. And that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.